So we're looking or thinking about changing, I say we, I mean me, uh, and the schools, thinking about changing the exam for this course, such that all parts will be compulsory. Okay, so you'll only have two questions to answer, you'll have multiple choice parts, and then if you look at the other exam questions, you have to you have two longer questions and you have to choose. Okay, but it seems looking at recent pedagogy that um, that's probably not the best idea because you take time choosing. So most people will all choose the same course, all choose the same question, and then they just waste time in making that choice. Um, so there's a number of other courses that you'll be doing which are compulsory uh, questioning, sort of uh, stuff that you can't do with most of them. So I'm pretty much, well, I've got to write my exam by the 17th. Uh, so generally, it's going to, I think it's going to be compulsory. The same is true with regards well, there's going to be also a difference if you're doing it online. So it's going to be not online, it's going to be a computerised if you like it. So first of all, who's used to doing computer exams on the well, computerised exams like on Blackboard? Did you ever do that? Well, you must do that already. It's what you call computer exams online. It's all been paper-based. Oh? It's all been paper-based. It's all been paper-based. What the hell? All schools have all been paper-based. Everybody's coming with a time to get the bottle out. It's kind of so old and painful. Then it should be electronic, yeah? <laughs> Not so gentle to take a such man. Any thoughts about it, then you can email me or you know, read Twitter. 
that kind of thing and look at the look at the give the monitor response. If I get silence, everybody's happy and things happen. Okay, that's my default position. So unless there's some real big reason why we don't want it to have, the electronic pay times we don't want to have the ones choices, then uh, then it's gonna be more compulsory and it's gonna be one of my in the electronic format of that one. Okay. You'll also have, although you will have an additional thing, so you'll get a, um, an additional writing book so you can make notes and you can also draw a drawing on the video and that kind of thing. I will mark both the console and the video so that I can see if you've not had enough time to finish everything in the library, but there are some notes which will be important, then I will mark the notes. Okay. We'll be going to note marking uh, in the revision lecture. Okay. All right, so. That's the kind of housekeeping bit. So like I say, if you've got any problems, you can email me or come speak to me at the uh, at the group. Okay. Um, okay, so let's have a look at the uh, the uh, self-assessment questions for chapter one. So what is the key focus of HCI? Okay. These are the self-assessment questions for chapter one. I mean, if you've all got them, <coughs> if you've all read, read up to chapter one and read the notes and these are the questions in there, you've all had a chance to do that and even discuss them last week. So, what's the key focus of HCI? Yes? Uh, So we don't know what it's all about. Okay, we'll get to find out because I spoke about it last week. Okay. So what's the purpose of the user experience specialist? Interface A is faster to navigate than interface B. 
What matters also is whether the experience of doing that is nicer. Is your feeling better? Because it doesn't matter if you take one or two seconds longer to so get a new case, if you had a better time doing it, that's still a better response. So that's the thing. There are no 100% correct answers in the US. How do we decide what's right and wrong? How do we decide what's right and wrong? Yes. Feedback from customers or experience? Feedback from customers or experience, okay, so that's one form of thinking about it. How do we think about that though? There's no 100% correct answers, what do we do? Do we think it's right? Huh? Do we think it's right? Do we think it's right? Really? Testing! Testing! So we want to understand the test if we're looking at extra user experience, we want to test stuff, but we're also sure that we're not going to get a 100% correct answer because that never happens. So statistical analysis, statistical tests, are there to give us some level of confidence about what we're doing, okay? But there's no 100% correct answer. And in science, in empirical science, can we ever prove something in empirical science? We can we disprove something in empirical science? Huh? To a degree, we can disprove something in Can we disprove something in empirical science? Yes, we can disprove something in empirical science. We can disprove it because we only need one case, one test case to fail to say it didn't work. Okay, to say that the hypothesis does not hold. Okay. But what about proving it? No, because we can't prove it. We can't prove it because we can't test everything. We can't test all instances of an open world. Okay? So we can only support. Okay. Five key properties of user experience.
let's move on. So today we're going to talk about, um, well, we're going to talk about something that is invisible to the universe, which is people. Okay? Humans, people. So we want to talk about all the things, all the different ways that we can um, take input and give output to people, first of all. The thing to consider with this is that with regard to people and the way that we build our applications, build our devices, build our systems to accommodate people, what we need to think about is what is the possible input and output of human experience. Now, who knows this guy? Any ideas who this guy is? No. His name is Jeff Bastin. Has anybody heard of Jeff Bastin? Who's got a Mac? Anyone? So if you've got a Mac, you're using his interface. Okay? So he's designed, he, he was the initial design, the first design of the Mac interface, okay? Back in the day. 70s, 80s, 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 he also used to like Star Trek, as you can see, so that's why he's got this bizarre Borg kind of uh, doodad on that looks a lot like Google Glass, doesn't it? Lots like Google Glass, but that was still good 10 to 15 years ago. Okay. So he's well ahead of his time. So this is what I'm going to I'm going to read you this quotation out loud, just so that you know it's important. Humans are variously skilled, and part of assuring the accessibility of technology of the individual skills match up well with the requirements for operating the technology. Okay. There are two components to this. Training the human to accommodate the needs of the technology and designing the technology to meet the needs of the human. The better we do the latter, the less we need the former. So if we make a system that doesn't need training, we end up training people. Okay, because it's, it's familiarity is right there. <coughs> That's why we have interfaces that work. Last week, if you remember, I was talking about how if you're building interfaces now, then you're very unlikely to build uh, interfaces unless it's, unless it's for large corporate platform vendors, you know, operating system vendors, because they're the ones that really set interface standards now. You're not going to use an Android product to create a completely different user interface. Really, okay? You can design the interactions differently, so interaction design is a different thing, but the actual interface itself you're not going to do much with. Okay? So that's one of the what, that's one of the, one of the points of this is so that that interface becomes familiar. The widgets and their use is familiar across the platform. The platform becomes familiar because so they all share the same kind of um, interface layout. Okay, the design blocks of the platform the same. So therefore this familiarity which translates to you're not going to do that much, but you might get to choose, get to do the, um, the interaction design. And what you also might want to understand is at times when you've got bespoke technology, okay, or new novel technology, you need to be thinking about everything about the human. Okay. So that's where you might be able to design some new technology, okay, some new interfaces, where you're thinking where you're designing it at a new device level. So like you know, a phone, uh, sorry, a watch interface. Uh, you might decide that, that's, that, that, that you're able to design an interface for a watch, a time or something like this. Okay. So that's a different thing. You might be able to design a new interface for washing machines, those kind of things, or, or any kind of device. Or the large non-off-the-shelf systems, such as the job marks, or like, uh, systems okay. okay, so we've got a number of ways we can get information in. So this is visual perception. So first of all, for visual interaction, what do we know about visual interaction? What does any of you know about visual interaction? Well, you've all got it. So the vision, tell me something about vision. 
So we know it's primary, we know there's a lot of areas devoted to it, we also notice that what is duplicate. Okay, so obviously we've got duplication, we've got large amounts of contact with nerves, and they spread out, so they become, they, they get the nerves that then spread into the two different parts of the brain, and the brain. But well, they're both connected to the same sensory device. So what you've got to think about is, is a disconnect between so this thing here. That's actually, and this is the case for most senses, really. There's a disconnect between what's sensing and what's doing and what's making trying to make sense of that <coughs> and how transmission works. Okay. So the reason why this eye, this eyeball, the sensor here, works differently is that or, or it's connected with both with two nerves pathways is in case this one's damaged. Obviously, or in case this is damaged. So that you get a signal that goes to the that can be processed. Now, the other thing about vision is that we have different kinds of receptors in the senses, obviously. We've got what kind of what kind of sensors do we have in our eyes? Huh? Yeah, we've got we've got cool sensors, yeah. Huh? Yeah, yeah, light sensors, yeah. So these are split into two general varieties. What are they? So we're looking at rods and cones. And these rods and cone sensors sense different things. So we've got things where we are able to sense peripheral stuff better than we're able to sense focus stuff. So we've got different kinds of sensors to sense different things. The thing about peripheral vision is that it's much better at night. Okay? And you've got lots more ability to sense at night. Now what does this say about um, how we explain information? So might it say that what we want to think about is we want to have lots of information going on in the periphery. We need to think about darkening the periphery. Okay, or lighting the periphery. Or on the on the monitor. So you're focusing on the central thing that we're doing, but <coughs> we can also see the peripheral alerts. All of this is interesting to understand. And the reason why these things don't occur is because most people who are building the viewers aren't, aren't, don't have a complete understanding of this kind of thing. Now,
Ibm's an here's one, here's one, one example. Ibm will build a system for for eye tracking, so that you can control mobile phones, you can control computers by the way we're looking. And it looked like it was going to work, but they kept getting a, quite a lot of errors whereby the system didn't work correctly. Okay. It just dropped out. And these technologists have no idea why. Okay. So, many of you know why, I expect not, but that's just yes. So what happens is, the reason why they weren't very bright is that when we're looking and when we're reading, we have these things called cadence, which are pretty units on our eyes, right? And this is normal, that's what we that's what we want, okay, this cadence. But there's also an integrated level So this is a case where we're actually looking backwards or we're not actually looking where we think the involuntary where the system thought it was supposed to be looking, so that it can fail. It wasn't expected in these days' cadence. The reality is that when they took people at Max Planck Institute in Germany, who were big into HCI and were big into understanding this kind of cognitive stuff, then they still were not, were not coming to these things. Oh, yeah. So as soon as they looked for those things, they threw out the other. Okay? So, uh, so that's why you can have mass control software. So I think that, so only by the combination of understanding stuff about, stuff about, individual user and their biology can you get good interaction when when you're working at the very extreme edges of stuff. So if you're working at if you're if you're working building interfaces doing user experience work for a large company <coughs> where you're not doing research and development, then much of this won't matter that much. But a lot of the time you guys are probably going to be in research and development situations, I suggest. Okay. Certainly because that's um, where your skill set will be applied. I'd imagine. Okay. Auditory perception. So what do we know about auditory perception? Yes. Yes, we can hear them at my age, not so much on the first thousand or whatever it is. But yes, so we can hear those stuff. That's good. Yes. Oh, because we have two ears in this direction. Yeah, because we have two ears in this direction. You know what else has to do actually? Anything else has to direction? Check the thing out on the outside, yeah, that's one thing, what was that? So who was a cyclist? Who's a cyclist? Who listens to music on their bike when they're cycling? No, no one. Good, that will save your life. But a new kind of headset has been created, which had a thing called, they're called bone headsets. Yeah? So you can still hear, but you can transmit the sound via the bone. Okay? So this thing is called head effect. Okay, so on, on this kind of auditory perception, you have to be called head effect, whereby you get small sounds that come and allow you to localize because the sound wave is transferred through your bone and your head into your um, into your middle ear. Okay? So you can do localization better. And that's why. In some cases, 3D sound sounds pretty good. To make it sound really good, you need a, an array. It's better to have a ray, an array, which would be like a super, of, uh, of um, speakers on your head so you can get the sound back. Okay, and that's why bone mic, sorry, bone um, uh, headsets are being created so that it can help to do some of that, so you can get this still effect. Okay. It's okay, we know that. What else do we know about auditory perception? Spoke at the start, I hope to so stop that. Sherry's cocktail party project? No? No? Okay. So, the good thing about hearing is that we can listen to sounds and we can listen to multiple sounds all at the same time. We can focus on the conversation of these things. But if somebody says something we're interested in, even quietly over, over the other side of the room, we can hear that and direct our attention. Somebody mentions our name oftentimes. And we're not in the same conversation, but you still with just our attention. And so this is called Cherry's Cocktail Party. Yeah. So 
what do we, how do we do that? How does our hearing support that? Okay. And obviously, you know about Fourier addition. So we know that you've got different waveforms coming in at different time offsets, and that they add together so that you can actually get them into your ear as one auditory stream, right? We know this. Yeah? Okay, and so then it translates, it transfers through the mechanical part of the ear. Okay, the bones of the ear, got three bones. Okay? We've got the very, very straight forward, and then we've got the hammer, the anvil, and the spear. Okay? And the anvil and the and that translates, that transfers the sound. What does that mean to do? Why is it there? <coughs> well, kind of. What it does, I mean, those things there is that I'm going to find that they're there to amplify the sounds that are related to the long frequency, and they're to actually dull the sounds at high frequency. Okay? And the stirrup is actually connected to the oval uh, part of the ear. When you can, and that means you've got your cochlea, which is where the oval uh, window is. The cochlea is full of fluid, and that fluid is in like, is in like a uh, spiral. And the reason why it's there is because there's a, there's a, uh, like a circular window, if you like, a circular deforming window as well. The reason the science is, is that if there's too much of a high frequency, then that frequency is translated to the cross. It might be so high that the mechanical part of the ear can't do anything about it. So therefore the sound wave is dissipated through the fluid and then out. It, then, then there's a different deformation space in the round part of the round window. So the cochlea into the sinuses. Okay. So that's how the sound is translated. In the cochlea, there's a thing called the bacilla membrane. And the bacilla membrane is like a rapid equalizer full of nerves. And that graphic equalizer for the nerves grabs the audio at different frequencies and transfers that audio at different frequencies to primary auditory cortex. Okay? So that's so the reason why, for instance, co why cochlear implants work. Who's heard of cochlear implants? Okay. So cochlear implants are a bit of a way to try and get uh, sound into uh, the well to get people who are the certain ones. Okay. 
those kind of things. So people have to think differently about how they created those interfaces as opposed to traditional standard commercial interfaces. Okay. okay. Somatic touch. Okay, so here we have different kinds of touch, receptive touch. Okay, so we know touch, we can feel quite a lot of touch. We also know that we can use touch in uh, virtual environments and virtual spaces because we have uh, Wood, especially for gaming and that kind of thing. And we also know that with touch, it's not quite the same as a system as a thing called haptics. So we know about haptics. Yeah, one, two, three, okay, so what about what do we know about haptics? Like <coughs> haptics is in my I, I only know it um, by like haptic feedback, like on a phone. Yeah. Like, some, like, like when you press something, it'll just kinda like vibrate, letting you know that you touched it. Yes. So you've got haptic feedback on the phone, so it vibrates. You can also have haptics. Um, on, say, force feedback joysticks for gaming, and you can also have haptics on various um, applications with regard to um, <coughs> shared experience over uh, shared virtual experience over distance. So, if you want to work together, if you're training your surgeons to cut into flesh, but you're trying to do that in a virtual way, in a virtual way, you need some way of applying force back to the surgeon so that they understand the level of force required to make a cut. So that's a different form of, of feedback that might be useful. Okay, well, back to it. Surely we don't use smell or taste. Surely not in computer systems. Do we think we do or do we think we don't? Um, do we know how big an update on a, on a, an Ajax website, on a, on a web 
but up, but up. The update that shows that something has occurred is normally a little box in a little curve that comes up and says something's happened. So how big does that need to be to draw your attention? In 92% of cases. Huh? Not half of the screen, but it needs to, but if you've not if you've not requested that update, it needs to be put. It needs to be about 32 millimeters by 18 millimeters or so. Okay. So that's quite big. So if it's not that big, you just miss it. Because you're not looking for it, it's because your attention isn't there. We've already seen last week about how our attention varies. Okay, so we can use any of these systems, any of these things we've looked at in the perception part. We can use any of those to try and refocus our attention on something. So we might want to, instead of changing the colour, for instance, on a, on a screen, what about the luminosity of an area? Could we change the luminosity so that the area of the screen becomes more luminous, which means all the other parts become darker, such that you can go, oh, that's what I want to do. That's what I need to be doing. And if you can do that, you can help the learning experience. <coughs> because you can let people learn where the system thinks they want to be going Okay, that's part of interaction design. So you need to be thinking not just about what is given, but what do we know about the human and how can we make sure that we're able to support things like thinking and learning and attention as we actually go through the interaction. So we've got different types of memory, declarative memory and non-declarative memory. Okay, so here we've got declarative memory, which is about facts and events. So what we're trying to do with facts and events is we're trying to we're trying to put those facts and events into your brain. So some of what I'm doing now is trying to put these facts and events in your brain by repeating myself. So as we knew, we repeat ourselves twice pretty quickly, maybe three times, and then at another you know week later we repeat ourselves again, which is why this sort of some questions over here. Okay, so that it's trying to put we put these things. Facts into your brain. So why do we do? Why do we do? Why do you have labs in the second year? Huh, we all ask that question. Why? Why do we have labs in the second year? Yes. <coughs> Say again. To reinforce what you're learning to like, to do something more. To give you to. to to do this non thing, procedural memory, skills and habits. We're trying to give you programming skills. We're trying to give you good programming habits. Okay, that's one of the things we're trying to do. That's why we're trying to do this with Git and the various other kinds of software engineering and uh, devices because it's just part of the habits that we report and this is what we do. Why does Git help give you loads of free repos if you're a student that you can drive it? Why? To get you good habits of using it, and then when you become not a student, you all know what to focus on. Okay, that's why. You know, it's not rocket science. It's trying to get you into the habit. Okay, then you've got also the classical conditioning. So you've got emotional responses, and you've got skeletal muscular responses. Okay, so the thing about emotional responses, what do we think about those? We associate an emotional response with something. Oftentimes, this emotional response is um, experienced very early because it's to do with our survival. So that's why we do it. Oh no, it's safe. Don't worry. Okay. But we can learn to overcome those responses. So we might not, if we're a boxer, we might not punch when we see a punch coming towards us because we're trained not to do that. Yet any more of this and it's on the half of the road, can't try to get out of the way. So that's not what we might have. Because we train ourselves to, to think that that's an okay experience. I'm the same is true if we're a boxer, we've got this um, smoking musculature stuff, whereby we're thinking about, well, how do we do this, how do we have this kind of muscle memory? <coughs> how can we execute it without thinking? So there's these things that we can tie into with regard to um, with regard to our interactions. Okay. Exploration. So who knows anything about exploration? What's in these sat nav kind of fields? So who's got who uses uh, for rear vision? Does anybody use this kind of exploration technique for rear vision? No? Okay, so there's 
exploration technique for reason which I think it's quite difficult to get to, but once you get to it, it's quite good. So when you think of the revision aspects as a journey, you know, you think that your approach is two dimensional, it's two different. There are different aspects of the work in different locations on this two dimensional journey. And therefore, because you're not trying to picture everything out right, and you're trying to associate one thing comes after another thing, it's far easier to work down to work in a procedural way using this exploration navigation kind of metaphor. The same is true for how we help exploration through interactions and interfaces. We already know that skills degrade, so if we don't, if we don't use the same interface for a month, our skill at using that interface and understanding the interactions degrades massively. Okay. So if that's the case, how do we do something about that? How can we help with that exploration? Okay, we'll get to it, we'll get to it later on in the course. <coughs> but one of the things we need to be thinking. What you also need to be thinking is that, that I'm giving, the reason why I'm giving you this kind of idea of you need to think about this is because in the next part of the course, I'm not going to tell you absolutely everything because we don't know absolutely everything. It might be that one of you guys comes up with something super novel in the future. Okay, it's likely that you will. Oi, guy at the back snoring. Hit him. Wake up. Sorry. Be in the lecture or don't be in the lecture. Okay. Right. Okay. Navigation. Not that tall. Jesus. Sort of maybe I am. Okay. So let's let's look at communication. Okay. So communication is really interesting. I love communication. Okay. So here we can see um, from an fMRI scan different parts of the brain lit up based on communication. So we can see that when we're thinking about words. We've got this, we've got this bit, okay, right at the front, okay, prefrontal cortex up, all the time, which is not fun, it's not fun. Oh, it's not fun. Okay, seeing words, so seeing words are right here, right, that's where we expect them to be. Okay, so if we go back, here we are, this is primary visual cortex, okay, up here, and at the back, and this is where we would expect to see things. When we're seeing this, right? Because we're experiencing them visually. Now, when we're hearing words, this is where we expect to see them, okay? So, just near the sodium fissure here, so that therefore we're looking at, um, generally, we're hearing words, and this is where primary auditory cortex is, okay? And then we've got speaking words, because this is where motor features are right here. Okay. So, we can see. But even though this is all about words, and this is all about communication, we're actually experiencing these things in lots of different spots in the brain. Okay? You can see, in hearing words, we're doing some thinking about them as well. Okay? Not as so much as actually the hearing part, we are doing some thinking about them. Okay? We've, also, we've also got this part here, the hypotemporal region at the bottom, where we're also thinking about that stuff. Okay? And we can see that that's the case. You know, can't, you can see that here, we've got very little activity in the front because everything's going on to looking, okay, on to seeing the words. And now you can see we can move on to this thing about the words. Okay. Implicit and covert communication. So what does this mean? What does the colour red signify on the woman's face? Oh, so is that an implicit? Or covert if you like communication because it's naturally associated with it. It doesn't say danger, danger. No. Huh? No. Love. Is that what you associate with that? Okay, maybe that's the case. But that's not. But that, that's one thing that it's not right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So but that but in this context, in the context of the interface, that's not what we associate because the interface is a learned behavior, right? Like we said before. We can if we go backwards. We can look at how we can change emotional responses to different things. So red is stop, wait. You know, this kind of thing. That's why we put the dots in that, which is a problem. Um, whereas, um, whereas that's not the case for we've got this red heart, this red blood thing. Maybe that's not the problem. Well, it's more dangerous. Who knows? It's a dangerous thing, emotions. Okay? So we've got this idea of implicit communication. Okay? So we need to think about that implicit <coughs> communication. How do we get across something that's a feeling, an impression, something that's going to tie into somebody's um, sort of basic biology, if you like, to get this implicit and covert information? All right. Ooh, so we've got different G 
general inputs. So I think these are quite straightforward. Right? You probably know all these. Keyboard, you've got keyboard input, cursive, which is naturalistic, pointing, which you've already got, yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, Pulse feedback, you know we've got pulse feedback, we're talking about that. Speech, we've got speech recognition, we've got touch, so we can include touch and we can include gestures. Maybe multi touch, multiple gestures. So, what's the difference between maybe touch and gestures? Uh, conjoined. So, sometimes your mobile phone will ask you to move it in, figure a way to that's a gesture. Yeah. Where have you got touch? And touch gestures, or whatever actually touching the screen. So you've got something that's in three dimensional space. Why is it actually to do a figure eight pattern? Calibrate the compass. Huh? Calibrate the compass. Calibrate the compass. Why to calibrate it? Why do you need to do a figure eight? What does that mean? Keep the drives in the Yeah, that could be an implicit thing. Okay, it's because it's obviously looking at the uh, hall, it's got a hall effect thing, so it's looking at the Earth's magnetic field, so that's what it's doing. So it's trying to get the different levels of magnetism, okay, so it can see where it's going. Okay, and then you've got gesture, okay, it's starting to be dimensional gesture, as you said, but that's the other Now, specialist stuff, hom. What's a hom? Any idea what a hom is? Head operated mouse, okay? So, head operated mouse is a device, if you like. Very, it's been very common for um, physical disability. Okay, very common. Now they're actually quite common in lots of other stuff. So the mouse itself doesn't really, it's not about, about really placing a, a cursor <coughs> or a point on a screen, but it's more about understanding where you're looking and what you're looking at. Okay, so you've got this head operated mouse in helmets and this kind of stuff, or things like tactical displays, those kind of things, the applications. Um, blink. So you've got a blink switch. So therefore, a, we can understand the difference between a voluntary blink and an involuntary blink. We can understand that the voluntary blink is about ten times slower than, a, than, a, um, than an involuntary blink. Okay. So therefore, we can understand by measuring the speed that somebody is saying, "I'm blinking," that means I want something to happen. So you might be able to do a mouse down or a selection by blinking. Okay. Gaze. We were already looking at eye and gaze controlled mobiles. If people were looking on Ars Technica this week, anybody reads Ars Technica? Yes, yes, few good people there. Then you'll have seen some work based on gaze and eye detection for mobiles. Okay, the news. Um, that would be excellent for your original thought question. Yeah. See, something I've not taught on the uh, course. News item in the, in the news, something in the news. Immersive and some way switches, okay, so these some way switches allow you to do two different options. It's more than it's more than brilliant, if you like, than on not. Okay, so just in time. Ten minutes. So uh, come back out um, eight minutes past. If you want to get the free notes, okay, the free notes, sign up here.